ইটা বন্ধ করে এডমিট হোল্ড করো কোথায় পাঠিয়েছো আমাকে sensehome@gmail.com আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে Can you see the screen? Yes, it's visible. Yes, oh. we can see. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, I think. Can I try to uh, share my screen, or is it uh, already a little too late? Please stop presenting. Otherwise, other ha. Okay, okay. Uh, if you want, you can share your screen. Uh, can I try to share my screen, please? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it says I can only share my entire screen. You, you have to share your entire screen. Click on it. But uh, I want to be able to share only a particular window. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sumati, Sumati, if you use Google Chrome, then you have the option of sharing one window. But if you use any other browser, you cannot do this. I don't have Google Chrome, so this is a real problem. Okay, let yeah. me see whether I can. Uh... Oh, this is a. I don't know how to do this then. I mean, uh, what? Uh, you have to click on the present now option and you have to select your entire screen and just open the window which you want to share. So then it will be opened in the. Okay, let no, me try. No, no. Let me try to see what I can do. Yes. Uh, let me see what this gives me. Which screen okay. it gives. Okay. Uh, I can I'm see. I'm feeling it's going to give me this screen. Huh. You have to open uh, your paper slide. Uh, because I was hoping. Okay, let me try to see whether I can do this now. Yes. Okay. Do you can you um, see this screen? Do you can you yes. see this? Yes. Yes. You just can have you to see? now uh, open your slide. Only uh, that slide will be visible, nothing else. Uh, let me see whether if I do uh, enter full screen, do you get it? Ma'am, I can see you your get... screen. You, do you, uh, no, can you... 
Okay, this is very complex. Okay, I'm really sorry, but I didn't know this about Google Meet, and I'm really confused now what I should do. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You just now, have to okay. You, you just have to make it full screen. Okay. Yes, now perfect, perfect. Okay, so let me uh, stop here now. You can keep it like this. But uh, do we have an opening right now? So I just will stop presenting now. So welcome everyone. Uh, our conference starts at quick trains in gravitational theory. And I would request our director, madam. I hope I am both visible and audible yes, uh, to the online participants. Am I visible and audible? Yes, ma'am. Very well. Okay. So uh, let me first extend a very warm welcome all the participants of this three-day conference that starts today on future directions in gravitational physics. And I basically was going to the webpage of the conference. And this pandemic era, as you know, it's really a challenge to organize the conference because uh, first people think of having a physical meeting. There cannot be a better option than that. But then, depending on the trend of the pandemic, we have to also tune our mode. So from a completely physical meeting, we have to make a compromise like a hybrid mode, like this one, where some of the participants you can see, they are physically here, and some of the participants are online. Uh, of course, this is the best compromise you can do in this situation. And I was going through the various topics that will be discussed in this conference, which uh, you know starts with uh, topics like gauge gravity duality to entanglement in gravity to quantum gravity. So it has a rather wide spectrum. And the speakers are from various corners of uh, this country, as well as speakers from abroad, also from various parts of the <clears throat> world. This is, I would say, one advantage. Everything has both sides of the coin and this is the upside of the coin that we can get speakers from various parts of the world and i'm sure you have uh, taken care of the time zone and all this uh, that you have to really think about and i also found that in the con in this schedule there is a good mixture of longish 40 minutes talk as well as contributed 20 minutes talk that is probably the best option because I'm not sure in this hybrid mode uh, how one can really organize a poster session. I have personally attended some of the complete online conference where there are poster sessions where you can, you know, they give you a virtual feel that I move to different room and get into different poster. But things are not as attractive as it would be in the real conference, real physical conference. So I think that is the best compromise. So with that, I wish all the success of this conference. And I'm sure all the par participants, online, offline, we are going to have a great time. Of course, uh, the online participants will miss all the fantastic food they will have here. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sure they will be compensated in future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, uh, so uh, this FTGP conference is, is basically a conference which brings in uh, uh, many different people and, and, and uh, they will discuss different areas of gravity and also different approaches to gravity. And I would like to uh, start this conference now. We, are, we have some time before we can start. And I would like to say that uh, my joint uh, convener is Professor Amitabh Lahiri, and he may also like to say some few words about the conference. So it's a, good morning, everyone, first of all. And it's a great pleasure uh, uh, to start this conference now. 
there will be 27 talks uh, in, in this conference and, and there will be 18 invited talks and nine contributed talks. The invited talks will be of 40 minutes duration and uh, the contributed talks will be of 20 minutes duration. And today uh, it is a pleasure to have Professor Shumati Shuriya from uh, Raman Research Institute and she will be uh, talking on uh, space-time entanglement entropy and uh, some recent results. So uh, let me thank Professor Shumati Shuriya for accepting the invitation and hopefully we can start the conference now. So we are actually going a little bit ahead of time. We have 10 minutes still to start, but we can start probably now. So please, Madam, we can start the conference. So you have sufficient time now. You can share and just pick the things up and then we can start the Okay, so we'll start a little early then. Okay, um, I'll just... Uh... I'll do what I was doing earlier, uh, so maybe it is a good idea that I'm not... Uh... <laughs> okay, I have to... Sorry sorry for this, but I'm not used to uh, Google Meet, so maybe it's a good idea that I'm starting a little earlier. Um... Uh, sorry. Okay, um, <clears throat> let me share my screen now, uh, my entire screen, allow, okay, and now I have to go into, I think, um, so before I begin, can I ask the organizers, uh, it's 35 minutes plus 5 minutes, is it? Uh, it's it's 40 minutes and then we have a buffer time of five minutes. So in that time okay. we can ask. So you can okay, take very time. Okay, very good. Okay, that's great. Okay, can you see my screen? Because now I can't see the other screen yeah, at all. It's visible. Yes? All right, yes. great. So I want to thank the organizers uh, for this opportunity uh, to give a talk at this uh, conference. It looks very interesting. I'm looking forward to listening to the other talks as well. Um, so today I want to talk about uh, some work that I've done in collaboration with uh, my student Abhishek Mathur, um, as, a, as well as my uh, ex-student Noman, who is now a postdoc at uh, University of New Brunswick, and also Yasaman Yazdi, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Imperial College. And these are the papers on which this talk will be based. But of course, I'll also talk about many, um, I mean, it's not only about the work that we've done, but also broadly this area. Um, I've embellished my title a little uh, with two uh, terms which are closest to my interest, which is the question of discreteness and covariance. So I'll be talking about the role of discreteness and covariance and how it affects uh, these notions of space-time entanglement entropy. Um, here's the outline of my talk. I will just say a few words about why covariance may be relevant in discussing uh, entanglement entropy, the standard formulation of entanglement entropy, even in quantum mechanics, which uses the state, and why covariance may be important uh, to uh, trying to generalize it to a covariant formulation. And this brings me to Sorkin's space-time entanglement entropy formulation, which, in fact, he presented in, I think, 2011 at the Goa conference, the big uh, GR conference we had in Goa. Um, and in the last decade or so, there have been attempts to try to understand this formulation from, more standard, from a more standard perspective. And uh, this work will be in that, along those lines. So... In the continuum, we have some examples that we've studied. Um, I will give some examples of space times in which these can be, this formula can be applied. And we get back the sort of expected um, entanglement entropy formulae in these cases. I will then move on to uh, the other part, which is that of discreteness. And this is, uh, I say a la causal set theory because there's a particular kind of discreteness that comes in from causal set theory 
from the causal set theory perspective. But for the purpose of this talk, I will be very brief in my discussion of causal sets because I really want you to think of it more as a way of covariantly discretizing space-time rather than as a full theory of quantum gravity. Uh, so in this talk, it will just appear as a way of doing a covariant regular, as a covariant regulator for the theory. And then using SOC in space-time entanglement entropy, which is itself a covariant uh, uh, formulation for causal sets. And what was very surprising is that the work that he did with Yasem and Yazdi was in two dimensions is that they showed that instead of a volume, instead of an area law, you get a volume law. But that when you do a certain kind of truncation of the theory, then you in fact recover the area law. So I'll, I'll end with a discussion on these various aspects of uh, that I've just, you know, that I've brought up in this talk. So just as a motivation, um, this is, uh, again, and I apologize if I haven't got all the references to all the work in entanglement entropy. It's very, very vast. And uh, for the purpose of this talk, I, I just have a few references that will appear on my slides. So uh, as many of you know, the idea of entanglement entropy as a source for black hole entropy was put forth by Bombelli, Corley, and Sorkin. Um, and the idea was to basically to think of, because we have a black hole region and we have a region outside, so the black hole region is possibly disconnected from the region outside um, in a certain specific sense. And so the entanglement between the interior and the exterior of the black hole is a way to measure its uh, entropy. And what they did was they looked at simple, uh, simple case of a coupled collection of coupled oscillators and thought of, you know, if you think of quantum fields as made up of an infinite number of these, then you, at least for a, in the finite case, so when you have just two of them, then you can write down the reduced density matrix, which has a Gaussian form of this kind, and calculate the von Neumann entropy for it. And this is a formula you get. Um, and as the number of oscillators are taken to infinity, then they looked at a specific example, and people have looked at this much more carefully than the calculation and many more scenarios. But basically the idea is that when you do that, you get the entropy that you calculate when you sum over all these oscillators gives you something that looks like the area of the, of the, you know, of the bounding of the, of the region that is bounding the two, two separate regions A and B, in particular what we imagine to be the black hole uh, area. Um, and so this is sort of the idea that entanglement entropy then becomes very important for studying uh, things like black hole entropy and so on. Uh, and um, one of the questions you might want to ask is, well, you know, there are situations where you might want to understand entanglement in, much, in a much broader context. So the way that we think of entanglement entropy is in terms of states that are defined at a moment of time. So the, you know, the density matrix is defined at a moment of time, and we look, think of this, you know, this region as a Cauchy hypersurface. We look at a region inside the Cauchy hypersurface, and we say, well, we entangle these two regions, but they're spatial regions which are entangled. And that's how we often think of um, entanglement entropy. But Cauchy hypersurfaces themselves, although they're very nice because we have a certain control over the space-time, we know uh, everything about the space-time, it summarizes in, its, in a sense everything that you need to know about the space-time, they're not always available. Uh, a prime example of this, of course, which many of you would be familiar with, is anti space spacetime And... Uh, uh, there, of course, you use complicated boundary conditions to make up for the fact that it's not uh, globally hyperbolic space-time. So stuff leaves, stuff comes in, but if you have a control of what is going in, so you put in boundary conditions, you can still get control of that space-time. Another example is topology change, where your universe splits into two regions, and you might have region A entangled with region B, and you really want to be able to measure that entanglement in some way. Another example close to my heart is causal set theory where 
even though there are analogs of spatial hypersurfaces, they're not Cauchy in the strict sense of the word. So we want to be able to move towards this formulation of entanglement entropy, which is more space-time in character. So in other words, we want to be able to generalize to space-time regions being entangled rather than spatial regions of spatial hypersurfaces. So here are two examples, one which we've already discussed, which is the trousers or the you know, topology changing space-time. And the other one on the left is that in two plus one dimensions, a pair of nested causal diamonds. So you have a causal diamond A sitting inside a larger causal diamond. And we have the two regions. So the entanglement is between the region that you've, you've already, you know, A, which is the smaller causal diamond, and its causal complement. And the causal complement are simply the set of elements or the set of events in that space-time, in the larger space-time region, which are completely space-like to uh, the original region A. So the entanglement is between these two space-time regions, and that is what one would like to capture. So in other words, we'd like to be able to ask, what is a space-time analog of a state in a moment of time? And in this context of... And just to give a perspective on this, when we... When people do algebraic quantum field theory, I will not go into this at all. I will not be using this formulation at all, which is to give you a certain legitimacy in, in thinking about things in terms of space-time regions rather than spatial hypersurfaces, is that in the AQFT formulation, we, you start off with operators, an operator algebra, C star algebra, whatever you like, over a space-time, full space-time. It's not defined at a moment of time. And the states that you have are defined with respect to this operator algebra. They, you, they basically maps from the algebra into the complex plane. And we define analog of density matrices in this way that, the, the, that it's given by the trace, the trace of the density matrix root rho gives you that state for that particular operator. So, in particular, what's very important is that these operators are not defined because they become very singular when you restrict them to spatial hypersurfaces or anything of go dimension one or larger. These operators become singular. So in order to regulate these operators, you can't really talk about these hypersurfaces anymore. You have to talk about thickened regions, thickenings of spatial hypersurfaces. You're really talking about space-time regions. And you, of course, want to do it in a way that respects causality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in particular, the state that we construct from the operator algebra in the full space-time, if you restrict it to a, a, a smaller region, to a sub-region of that space-time, then what you get is a sub-algebra of the original algebra. And a state that you get, that restricted state that you get, is therefore then not in general a pure state. In particular, if the causal complement is non-trivial, is non-empty, then it's not a pure state. Okay? And so in algebraic quantum field theory, these ideas are there, and the idea of space-time regions and states that are, that are defined really with respect to space-time regions, more general states uh, than what we are used to typically when we do physics. Um, so this brings me to the to Sorkin space-time entanglement entropy formulation. Like I said, he gave this talk in 2011, and the paper, I think, came out in 2012. Um, and it's based on a few ingredients, which I will go through uh, uh, in a little detail now. First of all, it is defined for a free scalar field theory, um, phi on mg. And... Uh, one important ingredient is the Weitzman function, which is the two-point correlation function. And when you give the Weitzman function, it also gives you the state. So for every state, you have a different, for different states, you have different Weitzman functions. So if you picked in particular the Weitzman function corresponding to the vacuum, then that gives you, a, you know, that's already defined, defining your state for you. But this state is now x and x prime are just two uh, space-time points, okay? So there's no mention of a Cauchy hypersurface. And again, when we restrict it to a smaller region A, then what we get in general is a mixed state. The second ingredient that we have, that we need, 
is a Pauli Jordan operator, which is the difference between the uh, retarded and the advanced green function, but also is a commutator, but it's a space-time commutator, uh, which is also called the Pyle's bracket. And it's, again, does not require definition of a Cauchy hypersurface. What one does is to elevate this uh, Pauli-Jordan operator as well as W to integral operators. And in order to do that, you need to restrict to regions which are compact, have compact support because the Pauli-Jordan operator, um, defined in this way as a convolution operator, has a domain which is of compact support. So we have to also restrict ourselves to regions A, which are of compact support, which are compact. Um, and this, putting these ingredients together, the formula that uh, this, this entropy, the space-time entanglement entropy looks, uh, has this form, that basically you solve for this mixed generalized eigenvalue equation. Uh, can you see my cursor? Sorry, hello? Yes. Yes, you can see my cursor. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yes, so um, you have this generalized eigenvalue equation where you've taken the state W in the full space time and you've restricted it to the region A. That's on the left side. And you have this eigen, and on the right side, you have the operator, which only is defined in A. I mean, it is anyway a local operator, uh, uh, the Pauli Jordan operator, local in the sense that uh, you know it's defined for, with respect to the two points in A, and of course now you're doing this convolution operation, which is defined over all of A. So they are integral operators, and the mu that you get in this uh, equation, so you solve for this and you find the eigenfunctions, but more importantly you find the eigenvalues, um, and you put them together into this. Uh, to define an entropy like this. Uh, importantly, these eigenfunctions mustn't belong to the kernel. So they shouldn't belong to the kernel of the operator I delta. Uh, here I should have put in an A. And that's the only requirement. If, you, if then it's not in the kernel, then really what you have is an eigenvalue equation of the inverse of delta A and W hat. And then you put, put that together to get an entropy. Um, again, this, uh, there's a motivation for this formula, which comes from finite degrees of freedom. Um, in that case, you can show using some actually very cute techniques of, I mean, differential geometry within this context of, um, you know, you, you can think of X and X prime as being um, indices. And you can show that in general, when you take... Um, this Weitman function, it, ha it comes with a piece which is the symmetric, real symmetric part, as well as an imaginary skew symmetric part, which is the I delta upon two. And you re in this, in, uh, through very general considerations, it actually splits up into this block diagonal form, which you can then interpret, each block diagonal piece can be interpreted as, um, as a single harmonic oscillator, uh, uh, as a single harmonic oscillator, but with a, in a Gaussian state, and that again is reminiscent of what uh, Bermeli, uh, Kaul, Lee, and Sorkin did for the uh, for their original calculation, and then you can calculate the entanglement entropy from that, and you sum over this to get the full entanglement entropy over all of these means because each block is separately can be solved. So the advantage of this formulation is that there's no mention of Cauchy hypersurface versus, uh, hypersurfaces, but the disadvantage is there that, I mean, if you want to think about it, uh, but you have to be careful, in other words, that, you have, that the domain of this operator has also always got to be of compact support. We've got a slight weakening of that condition, which I'll talk about, but uh, it, generally this is something to keep in mind. Um, it is still a proposal in the sense that the finite degrees of freedom, we know how things work. So in a certain sense, one, there is need to verify this, whether this in fact gives you the expected 
um, entanglement entropy? Is it a good measure of entanglement entropy? And that's sort of what one is trying to do, is to check whether this formula actually gives you what is expected. Because we don't know that this, uh, that this derivation actually works in the infinite dimensional case. So we don't know that that is the right definition of entanglement entropy more generically. So before I proceed, I just want to briefly mention, uh, uh, because it's going to come up, uh, uh, a way of defining a vacuum. Uh, it came up in the context of causal set theory. Uh, Johnston in his thesis basically uh, showed that if you want to define quantum fields, a scalar, scalar field on a causal set, then you need to think about quantization in a very different way. So you need to use a Pyle's bracket, but moreover, you need to think of the way in which to define the vacuum. You have to think of it in an entirely different way. And Sorkin realized that this is, in fact, something that can be generalized to the continuum as well. And this was spawned a certain interest in the community of algebraic quantum field theorists. Um, and here are just a couple of papers uh, that were written about it. So. The idea is that, again, you want to go back to this thing that you don't need spatial hypersurfaces. You don't need Cauchy hypersurfaces to define concepts of the vacuum. But instead, you focus on the Whiteman function as well as the Pauli-Jordan operator. And uh, to cut a long story short, you basically go, go to this Pauli-Jordan operator. And you, op you notice that it is Hermitian and skew-symmetric. So because it's Hermitian, it's, self -adjoined, it's a self-adjoint operator, it, um, you can use its eigenvalues, what we call the SJ modes, to basically to do a mode decomposition. And that mode decomposition, if you like, defines for you the vacuum. And uh, because of the skew symmetric part, the, the eigen, eigenvalues of this, uh, for, of I delta, come in these pairs. And the SJ vacuum is basically that state, that two-point function, which comes from the positive part of I delta. And it's therefore uniquely defined. There's no need for um, coordinate system, nothing. It's just coming from the properties of this operator. But we have to remember that this region M or A, or whatever we have, has to be well-defined. It has to be a compact region for this to be well-defined. Okay? So those are the constraints that we have. But nevertheless, this is a formulation. So let's look at the first case that was exam examined by uh, Saravani, Sorkin, and Yazdi uh, of uh, checking to see whether the space-time entanglement entropy uh, actually gives you the right, what, what you expect in known examples. So in 2D, uh, if you look at, so consider the Calabrese-Cardi formula where you have basically an interval and a smaller interval sitting inside the larger interval. And that is the smaller interval is this region here, which lies inside A along this red line. And the larger interval goes all the way from here. Also. It, it spans the entire larger diamond. So what we've drawn are the domains of dependence of the smaller region, smaller part of the interval, as well as the larger part of the interval. And the Cardi formula tells you that the entanglement of, the, of A with its causal complement should take this particular form. So then you want to implement this in the, uh, you want to see what ha whether the space-time entanglement entropy gives you the same formula. And this is what they did. They looked at the Sorkin-Johnston modes in the larger diamond, restricted that vacuum that you get to the smaller diamond, which is W restricted to A, and then in the smaller diamond, again, use the uh, Pauli-Jordan operator, but now using again using the Sorkin-Johnston modes to do the expansion. Um, this is a fairly hairy calculation. So they took the limit of uh, the size of the smaller interval, uh, the ratio of the size of the smaller interval to the larger interval to go to uh, zero, so much, much smaller than one. And in that limit, they could recover this calabrese cardi form here. So in other words, in this specific example, the, this new entropy formulation gives you what you expect. So this was the idea to, in, in the work that we did uh, more recently 
which was to say, well, we, the full cardiac formula is also defined on a circle where you have this additional piece here. And uh, can we reproduce that using the space-time entanglement entropy? And for this, we looked at a truncated... So, so just before I continue, I just want to say that in the case of the causal diamond, when we're looking at uh, 2D uh, massless scalar field on, in 2D, we know that it's infrared divergent. So in a sense, you can think of these causal diamonds as giving you a proper infrared cutoff. And um, similarly, in uh, 2D, on the 2D cylinder, in the massless case, we have the zero mode. And in order to regulate that zero mode, we have to have a cutoff. So we need to look at a slab of that uh, cylinder space time to make sense of this calculation. And so it's of a certain height. For that slab, you can define the what we call the fuster birch sorkin johnston vacuum. And these are just details that are not that important. And then the region that you're the, the entanglement regions are these this green diamond and the red diamond, which correspond to the length s along the circle and entangle with the length l minus s along along the rest of the circle. Okay, and what we've shown are the domains of dependence in green and red of these two regions, and they're the causal complements of each other. So. This is, again, a very hairy calculation when you actually sit down and look at it. But we put in a few simplifying assumptions, which is that the ratio of the height of the cylinder to the circumference is half integer, and also that the, the ratio of the size of, this di of the diamond, you know, the, the, the section of the circle, to the full circumference is rational. Then you can simplify it considerably enough to actually solve this on the computer on Mathematica. So when you do this, uh, you find, in fact, something very similar to the uh, calibri scardi formula for CFT on a circle, which is, uh, has this form. So here we have functions, uh, C of gamma, F of gamma, and gamma, remember, is the ratio of the height to the circumference. Uh, here are the results. So you get a very nice uh, general form, which is, um, basically telling you also about complementarity. We don't have to take limits. Everything can be solved without taking those limits. Um, and what you find is that this first uh, term, uh, C of gamma, is approximately 1 when you calculate it numerically. And the second one has this property that it very quickly saturates to a constant um, for a long enough cylinder. So you do get back for a long enough cylinder, which you can think of as actually going to the case of an infinite height of the cylinder, you get back the Cardi formula. So that's another verification of uh, the entanglement entropy formula. Can, uh, okay, so I, I just want to make sure I have enough time, but uh, uh, I think I have a feeling I'm running short. So can I just get some verification of how many minutes are left? because I started early, so I just don't want to run too much over time. Okay. All right. So, okay. So, so. You have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Thank you so much. So, um, so more generally, so before going into the uh, more specific examples, we decided to just look at the form itself of the entanglement entropy formula and see, is there a way to generally you know, making some simplifying, but very general simplifying assumptions, say something about uh, the nature of this, uh, of the, of these modes of, of the eigenvalues, and therefore the nature of the entanglement entropy, can we just look at the mode decompositions and get something out from there? So the idea is to just look very generally at region M, which is, and region A, which is contained in M, and we have, you know, Klein-Gordon modes, uh, which are Klein-Gordon orthonormal in region M. And those are what, what I call phi of k. And then we have psi of k, which is, are the Klein-Gordon modes in, this, in the region A, which is contained in M. And, and these are just space-time regions, of course, right? But, of course, the Klein-Gordon inner product is defined with respect to Cauchy hypersurfaces and so on and so forth. So that's, that's a given. So we accept that they're in, in this case, 
we have Cauchy hypersurfaces, and we're looking at that case and trying to see what we can extract in, in that particular situation. So, of course, when we do the expansion of the two-point function in terms of the uh, modes in the smaller region, we have this messy long form. But now, remembering, and this is something I actually uh, forgot to mention, which is that what's very important when we talk either about the Sorkin-Johnson vacuum or even about the space-time entanglement entropy formula is that we're really talking about things that where there's an L2 because, you know, the, the region is compact. Um, so the L2 norm of, of functions has to be well-defined. And the SJ modes are L2 orthonormal. Okay, we, they also are, therefore, Klein-Gordon orthonormal, but they're, in addition, required to be L2 orthonormal. So when you do this, when you say, when you require that the modes in the smaller region are also L2 orthogonal, then you can simplify the eigenvalue equations considerably, and you find that, in fact, the eigenvalues come in pairs, mu plus and mu minus, which are related to each other by uh, mu plus being equal to 1 minus mu, mu minus. And then you can write a modewise entanglement entropy, which just sums over mu p plus and mu p minus, the part contributions. And what we also found, sorry, yeah. Sumati, can I ask something? Sorry. Sure, sure. I can't see you, so can I stop sharing my screen for a second? Because, oh. okay. okay. No, 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 please don't do that because it will disturb. Uh, okay, yeah. fine, fine. All right. Can you please go back to the previous slide where you did this uh, cylinder? Yeah, one more, one more slide. Okay. Yeah, so my question is, so uh, just to understand if I am understanding the calculations correctly, so you are, you are given the W function and mm -hmm. given the W, you are finding the psi modes in this the green wedge. Is that? No, no. So, so, so let me just quickly go over that once again. So the W that you want to calculate in, in the entanglement entropy formula, you start off with a W in the full, whatever the region that you have, okay? The larger region, right? Yeah. So in the larger region here is a slab of the cylinder space-time. And the, that's where you're defining your vacuum. Your pure state is there. Okay? That's the pure state you're starting off with. In, uh, in our case, we're starting off with the vacuum, right? Yeah. And yeah. then we're restricting that to either the green or the red region. So the yeah. full modes, psi are the modes in the full slabs of the cylinder, and that's the Sorkin Johnston vacuum in the full cylinder slab. Okay. And it's a pure state. When you restrict it to the green or red regions, they become uh, mixed states. The, does that answer? Yeah. Yeah, yeah partly. And, uh, yeah. So the, the modes, the psi modes, uh, they are not only supported in the green region, they have support outside also. Yeah, 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 absolutely. They're in the entire slab of the cylinder. I don't know if you can see my hands, but basically, oh, let me just say it, they're in this entire white region, including the green and red region. Okay. The entire thing. So there, there, that's why you have a zero mode. No, I mean, yeah. you understand. Okay. Thanks. 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 Yeah. And then you have to expand when you restrict it, then you have to go to the modes that are relevant in that causal diamond, green or yellow, uh, green or red causal diamond. And those modes that we use again are the Sorkin Johnston modes because those are well defined and they are L2 orthonormal in that region. Yeah. That L2 orthonormality is very important because you really want to be able to expand things one in terms of the other, right? So that completeness is very important. Yeah. Of functions. Okay. All right. So. The next thing that we did was to then uh, now take the paraphernalia that we have and examine other uh, space times, which are, of course, of more general interest than the causal diamond, uh, and that is de Sitter horizons, both de Sitter, just plain de Sitter horizons, that is cosmological horizons, as well as um, de Sitter Schwarzschild horizons, and see whether this space time entanglement entropy formula. Is, gives you what you expect in, in these cases. So in the case of the de Sitter horizon, we of course have, this is a conformal diagram, and you know this is your spatial hypersurfaces red guy here, 
and the entangle, entangling surface is this region here. And that's the, uh, that's sort of the typical way in which we think about De Sitter space time. But now, of course, we want to talk about regions of De Sitter and uh, in which the, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so, so now we, for convenience, we look at the conformally flat patch, which is one and three. And we define, we look at a, a vacuum in that region. And here we chose the bunch Davies vacuum in that region um, and restricted to this wedge, which is region one. And of course it's spatially compact, but it's not temporarily compact. And as I pointed out right towards the end here, um, when A is spatially compact, but not necessarily tempor temporarily, and when it is static, then as well, we can, this whole formulation, this whole way of thinking about it actually works. So even though I had earlier said a lot about the fact that region A has to be actually compact, if it is static, as well as uh, spatially compact, you can get by with using I delta and defining it because in these equations, um, it, you, you get delta function normalization in the time direction, and so that drops out very nicely. So uh, you can basically then... No, sorry, Sumati, the, can I interrupt yes, you just, sure, just for no, a second? Please. So am I to understand then that only when A is basically a Cauchy hypersurface, then the results are much clearer. Is that is that true? I mean, no, if A you, is you, not... Yeah, so very importantly, A is not a Cauchy hypersurface here. A but is, if you look uh, at, you said you wanted is, to look at the static situation. Sorry, the? You wanted to look yeah. at the static situation. Yeah, no, no. So, so these are just statements, general analysis that we can, so the, 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 the formula holds more generally, but we're trying to do some algebraic manipulation to simplify things in certain cases. We notice that in these particular cases, things simplify enormously. That's all. We're not saying that it doesn't hold more generally. Okay, thank you. Yeah, all right, yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that was Partho, right? Hi, Partho. <laughs> yeah. um, hi, Sumati. So, <laughs> uh, but, okay, so, um, so basically we use this, you know, messy calculations uh, due to Higuchi and Yamamoto's uh, more decompositions and so on, and we managed to we and it turns out that a lot of that is actually just gives you the same result that they got when they calculated the space time entanglement entropy. And, but we were using this space time, the so they they calculated the von Neumann entropy, sorry, and we use the space time entanglement formulation, and we get the same results that they do. So let me just quickly also say that we did the same thing for the Sitter Schwarzschild. There, of course, you only know the modes near the horizons and so on. Uh, but since it's only the Bogolyubov transformations that matter to our calculation, um, the, the, you know, the messy slide, two, two slides before, which showed all of those calculations, uh, that's all that you need. So we showed that even in these cases, you get out exactly the expected mode decompositions and uh, you get exactly the entanglement entropy that you expect from von Neumann entropy. So, so far, so good. We've seen that in these various examples, um, these four examples, that the space-time entanglement entropy gives you what you expect from von Neumann entropy. So even though we don't know that they're formally equivalent to each other, there's no general proof of that. We've shown it in four different, there are four different examples of it. So, of course, uh, at the heart of my interest in this question is what happens when we talk about covariant discreteness? What happens on causal sets? So like I said, I'm not going to give you a summary of causal sets. There's no time for it. And please ask me questions later. Please feel free to ask me questions, even on, uh, over email. But the causal set hypothesis was put forth by Bombelli, Lee, Meyer, and Sorkin in 1987. And what's important for us is to think about it for the purpose of this talk, you can just think about it as a covariant discretization of a space time. And that covariant discretization takes the form of a random lattice, which is obtained by a Poisson sprinkling. 
And the relations that you see here, these lines, correspond to the causality relation. So what you get out of this is a partially ordered set. And because it's a Poisson distribution, that means that on an average, the number of elements in any space-time region is proportional to the volume of that space-time region. And this goes back to some theorems in Lorentzian geometry, which tell you that if you have the space-time volume element in terms of a conformal factor, as well as a causal structure, then you can reconstruct the space-time with very weak causality conditions thrown in. So this is the motivation for causal set theory. And for us, we can just think of it as a good way of covariantly regulating or discretizing space-time. So a question that arises is that, can it be a covariant regulator for black hole entropy? Because as you saw in all of the calculations, one always has to put in a cutoff. Although things are defined mode-wise, when we finally do the calculation of the full entropy, you need some kind of cutoff, otherwise it blows up. And you can take that as a positive or a negative. From my perspective, it would be nicer if we had a way of defining a cutoff in a more meaningful way. So um, you can use, therefore, now you can see why it's important to be able to construct a quantum field theory on a causal set. And so that, uh, uh, you know, you can see that if we had those green functions, the retard and advanced green function, which is what you need for defining a Pauli Jordan operator, then that will allow you to construct using the Sorkin Johnston vacuum a quantum field theory for a free scalar field on a causal set. And then from there on, proceed to calculate the uh, entanglement entropy on a causal set. Just very quickly, green functions on causal sets. Um, uh, if you think, if you look at Minkowski spacetime, then we have a very simple green function, massless Minkowski spacetime, which is basically that it, uh, the, for any x, you have support only for the retarded green function, you have support only on the past light cone. And this is a very simple causality condition because it's basically telling you that any element, if you think of it as a discretization, then you have x as an element of the causal set. Any element in the past of that causal set belongs to it, has a non-zero uh, uh, green function, uh, so, right? I mean, G is zero with respect to that. So all I need to look at is that the, the things that are causally related to the past of X, and that is the causal matrix, and I can use that causal matrix to construct the green function. This is my discrete green function here. And you can, Johnston, and so this was fantastic work that uh, Steve Johnston did in his PhD thesis. He unfortunately left the field, but he did some very nice work on constructing green functions and constructing uh, quantum fields, scalar quantum fields on causal sets, and basically generalized to the massive case by using a discrete convolution. In four dimensions as well, you can uh, define it, but now you need to uh, approximate the delta function that you have along the light cone. And that you do by looking at the, the set of nearest neighbors that you have to x. The set of nearest neighbors are not all elements that are causally in its past, but only those that have no intervening element between them. And there's a sense that that makes sense because in the continuum, it doesn't make sense, but it does in the discrete case because you, of course, have a cutoff. You have a discrete cutoff, which is a volume cutoff, space-time volume cutoff. So you can similarly construct green functions. And something we showed uh, uh, later was that it, this construction actually generalizes to Riemann normal neighborhoods in two dimensions, as well as in four dimensions with certain uh, conditions on the curvature. But more importantly, and for our interest, to de Sitter spacetime, and also, by the way, to anti de Sitter spacetime. So in de Sitter spacetime, it's exactly of the same form. So you can construct massless and massive green functions in two and four dimensions, uh, yeah. de Sitter spacetime. Sorry? You have around four minutes. Four minutes, okay. I will uh, try to hurry up. So I will just give you the punchline, which is that when, um, Sorkin and uh, Yazdi calculated this, took their continuum calculation and did it on, a, on the causal set, they found that something very surprising. They found that without a truncation, so importantly, the, the spectrum of the Pauli-Jordan operator in the discrete case, so if you have the continuum, which is the black line, 
the discrete spectrum, this is a log log plot, has this very characteristic knee, which of course changes as you make the density larger and larger, the sprinkling density. But if you don't put in a truncation, then what you get is a fundamental volume law. This entanglement entropy does not give you an area law. However, when you do truncate and you say that, well, there is, you know, let's look at only that part that co corresponds to the continuum, then that uh, gives you back the Cardi formula in this two-dimensional case. Uh, what's very important here is that, remember that we looked at the eigenvalue equation and we said that the eigenfunctions have to not belong to the kernel of I delta, but as you can see, these are, these, the spectrum here, which is due to the, you know, the, the, uh, the discretization, this has things that are very close to, but not exactly in the kernel. So there's a very large number of these non-kernel elements, but which are very close to the kernel, which contribute largely to the entropy, and they contribute to the extent of a volume law. Um, and we carried this out extensively for De Sitter horizons. Uh, this was a very large amount of simulations that we did. It was, you know, exhausting amount of simulation. And we found that, in fact, what they had was not an artifact of two dimensions. It's, in fact, presumably generic to all causal sets. We found that in the De Sitter case, without the truncation, you again get a volume law. But when you put in a truncation, then you get the expected area and volume laws. So let me just end uh, with this discussion, So, uh, which is that the covariant form of entanglement entropy is useful in extending to situations without Cauchy hypersurfaces. Um, in the continuum, we've seen that it, it should, gives the correct quantum field uh, entanglement entropy in a variety of different space times. One question that, uh, again, is to try to be able to see where this way of thinking about entanglement entropy uh, arises from in, a, in algebraic quantum field theory. Is it related to the modular operator? These are questions that we would like to understand better. Um, but I have to say we haven't made too much progress on this. Um, and to also to generalize to see whether we can actually show that more generally that gives you the right entanglement measure in the infinite dimensional case. I think one interesting question is also to look at the topology changing space time and see whether we can in that instance, in, even in the continuum, try to see whether we can make sense of the entanglement entropy. What is it a measure of? What does it tell us about the region, in the, the nature of that entanglement? In causal set theory, we, had, we found that the volume behavior looks like it's generic, and that when you have a truncated spectrum, it does give rise to area laws. Um, and a question which is very much on the forefront of our minds is, you know, what is this really telling us? Is it telling us something about the nature of space-time discreteness and quantum gravity? Why do we really expect the area law to hold at the very small and so on and so forth. And I'm sure many of you will have inputs into this last question. So let me end there. Thank you very much. So it's time for questions now. Uh, may I ask a question, Sumati? Very nice of talk, course. by the way. I enjoyed it. Um, so the truncation that you spoke about, especially the one at the end where you got the four-dimensional result from the volume law, the truncation leading to the area law. I was wondering whether the truncation is kind of a unique truncation, or is there a choice you're making based on physical considerations? Right. So, in the case, in the two-dimensional case, it was actually relatively easy to put in a because what happens is that the spectrum comes in a there's a, a momentum operator there. And the spectrum has a, it's a discrete spectrum. And then you can put in an equivalent of a momentum cutoff. And that has the right features to it. More generally, however, you don't always have, that's because you also had access to the continuum spectrum. So when you don't yes. have access to the continuum spectrum, of course, it is absolutely what you're saying is true that we, you know, what is the truncation scheme you adopt? What is it? What is the right one that you should adopt? 
So right. if you look at this, it's a log. Uh, it's, I mean, I don't, I can't see you if I share my screen, but I'll, I'll share it very briefly. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, um, okay, I, I, am I, okay, okay, here, here's my screen. You full screen. Oh. Uh, yeah, so let me just go yeah. back to this, uh, this uh, guy here. Okay, and um, uh, you can see that this is a log log scale. So there's a scaling behavior for a good part of the spectrum. Okay, because right. these, this is a very large number of, uh, I forget how many eigenvalues we have, but it's a very large number. You can see that's a very dense set here. Um, but at some point, the knee appears. So how do we estimate? So we tried different ways of estimating it purely from a, without, you know, without using continuum information. And by mm -hmm. and large, all of those estimates are fairly good because they basically are talking about the point at which there is a, uh, there's a deviation from the, so it doesn't matter exactly where you do the truncation. Of course, the coefficients in front of the behavior the area low behavior will modify according to where exactly you do the truncation. Right. If you did it yeah, that, well into the really knee the... region, if you do it well into yeah. the knee region, you don't. But you can use somewhat, um, let me put it this way, you can use somewhat uh, more um, objective criteria to, which is what we tried to do, to determine when the log, the, lo the scaling behavior stops. Because this right. is but, off the scaling. But behavior. if you just, just go ahead a bit, and then for various uh, choices of this point where the scaling behavior stops, you can actually calculate correction, couldn't you? And then these corrections ah. also, like we did in loop quantum gravity, you know? So yes, there is a yes. way of calculating corrections to the area law. Now, in loop quantum gravity, we were able to show that the coefficient is unique, doesn't matter where you trunk it. And here, I was wondering how unique that would be. That would be a very interesting question. Actually, that's a really interesting question because what we could do, I mean, you could go the other way around. We could say, well, here's right. the area law that we expect. Right. That is, right. you know, we know. Right. I mean, I, I mean, here our idea was more like, can we get that area law? But what you're right. asking is very interesting because you're saying, assume that area law and whatever else we right. get is a correction. Well, that's right. a very interesting, very interesting. And so, of course, now, depending on where that truncation is, it's not going to be a if you take in all of the modes, the that would correction be different. is they would so overwhelming. Yeah, if you yes. that correction is so overwhelming, it it wipes out. So it is no subleading correction. It is mm. dominant. So we have to. But it's a good question whether in that you know semi-classical regime where you're doing the truncation, whether we can extract some information out of that. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Indeed. Uh, sir, Girmani probably has a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, Sumati. Uh, thank you yeah, for hi. the nice. Yeah. So one question about these Higuchi modes uh, that you discussed. Uh, so yes. you talked about the Poincaré patch of uh, De Sitter. Um, yes. So there the spatial slices are non-compact. Uh, yes. And that doesn't uh, uh, has no, has any effect on your. No. So let me uh, go back. And in fact, I'm right on that slide. No, actually, I will. Uh... Sorry, give me a few seconds. Um, let me just go back to the one that I, uh, the picture that we had earlier. Ah, yeah. So you see the region that we're restricting to yes. is the region in which the Pauli Jordan operator is defined and which the convolution operator here. So let me go back to this here. Um, this operator here. This is the generalized eigenvalue equation. And this is defined purely in the region A. And so in a sense, it doesn't matter where you got W from. It has to be this convolution operation has to be well defined in region A. Okay, almost so while, sorry? Time is almost up, so you can okay. just. Okay, sorry. So, so I just wanted to say, yes, it doesn't, because the region A is spatially compact, it works. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, if there are more questions, let's thank the speaker once again for a very nice talk. And. Uh,
hello can i ask a question to sumati this is shayan here so, oh hi sir you're not allowed yeah. to i think right now they're trying to stop this talk <laughs> okay okay no, please go ahead is it this it's, it's a general question it's not really yeah. related to your talk so you showed the trousers topology right at the beginning and it's known that there's infinite particle production okay so and then there was a paper in 2016 by krasnikov which says that that's bounded so what's your comment on that I mean, is it what's the no i don't know this work conclusion actually about I, I, So no, it's in Physics B in 2016. Okay, I'll take a look at it. Thanks, Shan. I had it. I wasn't aware of this paper. I know that people did the trousers uh, calculation for the SJ vacuum, and they also found the yes, similar. Yes, yes, that I know. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, the, that they also found a similar blowing up. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not it does this or. Uh, but uh, you know, for in terms of defining the SJ vacuum, defining these, even if it is. Uh, even if the stress energy tensor blows up you might still be able to calculate a um entropy that's the point sam that's what i yeah no that okay. is okay but uh, yeah. this paper was after the paper by the sorkin johnston in okay. sorkin johnston so i'll definitely paper. take a look at it is this kirill yeah, yeah. krasnikov or krasnikov no 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 okay. this is krasnikov this is okay krasnikov. i'll take a look at it thank you very much yeah, yeah. yeah. i'll yeah. do that nice talk thank you sumit okay. for thank really you. nice talk thank you thanks yeah yes yes thank you uh first i thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my research work in the conference today i shall talk on generalized uncertainty principle in the resonant detector of gravitational waves the journal references of this work has given here uh please uh, next slide go to the next slide right the plan of my talk is as follows at first i shall briefly introduce about the generalized uncertainty principle namely gup and the motivation of our work then i shall discuss about the brief methodology where we calculate the transition amplitudes due to the gravitational wave of a harmonic oscillator in presence of generalized uncertainty principle or gup after that i find the transition probabilities in presence of gup for different type types of gravitational waves and finally i conclude by summarizing all the results of this paper uh, please next slide okay various theories of quantum gravity strongly proposed the existence of an observer independent minimum length scale namely the planck length which is the order of uh, 10 to the minus 33 cm in fact the existence of minimum length demands to modify the heisenberg uncertainty principle to the generalized uncertainty principle some observations near the planck energies along with uh, a combination of thought experiment and rigorous derivations suggest that the generalized uncertainty principle holds at all scale and it is represented by the modified heisenberg algebra which is given in here in, in the equation 1 note that all these variables q and uh, q y and p j uh, follow the standard jacobi identity here beta is the gap parameter and defined as beta 0 divided by mpl multiplied by c the whole square well mpl is the planck mass now it is uh, also quite natural that the order of the dimensionless parameter beta 0 would play a crucial role for realizing such effect of the gap therefore a lot of effort has been put to find an upper bound of the gap parameter beta 0 a literature review shows that the resonant frequencies of a mechanical oscillator and an optomechanical scheme serve as a good candidate of detecting gup effects 
uh, next please okay. in spite of these uh, works the fact remains that the testing of GUP is extremely challenging and therefore initiates the proposal of a realistic experimental setup to test the GUP. On the other hand, the gravitational waves are the ripple in the fabric of space time. Uh, then a new window in exploring the high energy phenomenon has been opened with the direct detection of gravitational waves. Among many other GUP detectors like ground based and space based, based interferometers, the study of resonant bar detectors is fundamental because it focuses on how GUF interacts with the elastic matter. The present day GUF detectors strive to detect the length variation of the order of 10 to the power minus 18 to 10 to the power minus 21 meter, which may be sensitive enough to allow us to probe the effect of quantum gravity. In the recent past, the normal modes of a Tom scale GUF detector set has been analyzed to probe the possible Planck scale modification in the ground state energy of, of an oscillator. Such effects may uh, appear near the Planckian scale. Therefore, it is possible uh, to, uh, that some low energy relics may exist and their phenomenological consequences may be important at the level of quantum gravity. Next. Therefore, we want to explore the GUF matter interaction in the GUP framework that can anticipate the GUP effects in the GUF detection events. Here, in this work, we demonstrate how the GUF, uh, uh, how the presence of GUP modifies the responding frequency of a resonant mass detector and the corresponding probabilities of GUF induced transitions that the phonon modes of uh, the resonant mass detector undergo. To do this, first we analyze the vibrations, which are nothing but a quantum mechanically forced harmonic oscillator. Thus, the response of a resonant detector to G wave can be quantum mechanically described as a G wave harmonic oscillator interaction. With this motivation, we have studied the interaction of G, interaction of G waves with the simple matter system in a GUP platform. Next. To do this, first we write down the Lagrangian of the system uh, given by the equation 2. Uh, by the canonical transformation, we uh, get the uh, Hamiltonian immediately, and this Hamiltonian given uh, reads as uh, equation 3. Uh, here, the gravitational wave is taken care by the uh, by the term capital gamma j 0k, which is equals to 8jk dot divided by 2. Now, 8jk contains the polarization information of GFs. The linearly polarized GF can be expressed as uh, 8jk function of t is equal to 2a epsilon cross sigma 1jk plus epsilon plus sigma 3jk, where 2a is the amplitude of the GF and epsilon cross and epsilon plus are the two possible polarization states of the GF satisfying the condition epsilon cross square plus epsilon plus square is equal to 1 for all t. Next. Now, to incorporate the GUP effects, we write down the position and momentum operators up to first order in beta obeying the previous uh, equation 1, which reads like this. Here, we treat the resonant bar detectors as a one dimensional system, as a typically detectors uh, uh, has a length of 3 meter and radius 30 centimeter. Therefore, the Hamiltonian of the system can be written as the summation of H0, H1 and H2, which are given by this uh, H0 is uh, P square by twice M plus half M omega square Q square and H1 and H2. Here H0 stands for the uh, harmonic oscillator of ordinary, ordinary system. H1 and H2 are the time independent and time dependent part of the Hamiltonian. Note that H1 arises only for presence of GUP. And the first part of H2 contains only the GUF contribution, which arises uh, gamma, uh, capital gamma 1, uh, 0, 1. And the second uh, one shows the combined effects of GUF and gamma. Next. To proceed further, we now define rising and lowering operators in terms of the oscillator frequency omega 
like uh, QJ and PJ, PJ uh, as given in the equation 6. Hence, the Hamiltonian in terms of the rising and lowering operator can be recast as H0, H1, uh, next, and H2, like this, equation number 7. It is to be noted that H1 and H2 are small compared to H0. Therefore, you, we can treat H1 and H2 as a perturbation. Our aim in this paper is to calculate the perturbed energy eigenstates, their corresponding energy levels, and the transition probabilities among them. Therefore, first we calculate the time independent perturbation theory using the Hamiltonian H1. Next, applying the time independent perturbation theory, we get the modified energy eigenstate of a simple harmonic oscillator uh, by the equation this with the corresponding modified energy uh, values E0 beta, E02, and E2 beta, and E4 beta. Here, Capital delta is equals to beta h cut m omega is a dimensionless parameter showing the GUP effect. Next, now we calculate the transition probabilities between the part of state using the Hamiltonian 2, which is a time dependent part of the Hamiltonian. The transition rates, uh, transition amplitudes reads by the equation 8. Here, capital A and capital B are the dimensionless quantity. Note that uh, if delta beta tends to zero, then capital B also tends to zero, and capital A takes the value of one by root two. In the limit beta tends to zero, therefore we get the transitions for ordinary harmonic oscillator in one dimension with the GOF uh, gravitational wave. This is uh, one of the main findings of our paper. Uh, next slide, please. Now. Uh, this transition amplitude shows that uh, the presence of GUP can be checked by measuring uh, some corresponding transition probabilities from the relation Pij is equals to mod of Cij the whole square. Now we can see that uh, in the previous slide, the for an ordinary harmonic oscillator, only zero to two transition will occur. But due to presence of the GUP, we get another transitions which is from zero to B, uh, four state with different amplitudes. Now, we consider the simple scenario of periodic GOA with linear polarization. This can be written by equation number 10. The amplitude here, the amplitude varies sinusoidally with the single frequency omega. Therefore, the transition rate becomes uh, this and this, where uh, uh, capital delta contains the gap effect. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, from the above results uh, in the previous slide, we can make the following observations. The transition rates shows that the detector resonance with the G wave at the frequency capital omega 1, which is equals to omega uh, multiplied by 2 plus 9 delta and cap capital omega 2 equals to omega 4 plus 30 delta respectively, due to the presence of the direct delta functions which make the transition rates non-zero around those frequencies. Uh, for those frequencies. Notice that the resonant frequencies for the transition from the ground state to the excited state get modified by the GUP parameter. Secondly, here we get two transitions instead of one. The transition from the ground state to the second excited state is already there in the standard Heisenberg uncertainty principle framework. In, inter interestingly, the transitions from the ground state to higher excited states are only due to the presence of GUP. Further, the expressions of capital A and capital B, the constant in the previous uh, slide, it is clear that the terms both linear and quadratic in the dimensionless GUP parameter beta will appear in the transitions. It is a good feature for detecting the presence of GAP as linear dependence of beta is easier to observe. Now, the resonant frequency due to the gap must be less than the resonant frequency itself. This inequality therefore gives 9 delta omega less than 2 omega, which gives an upper bound relation of beta 0, which is beta 0 less than 2 by 9 multiplied by Planck mass divided by mass of the resonant detector and the MPC square divided by H cross omega. Next. Now, if we put the typical values of a the mass of the detector, bar detector, 
uh, the operating frequency and the plank mass, we get an upper bound of beta zero, which is uh, beta zero less than 1.4 into 10 to the power 28. And the correct and the correction <coughs> to the resonant frequency 9 delta omega, which takes the value 1.3 kilohertz. Hence, this simple calculation shows that the GUP modes can ring up in order to be detected by the resonant bar detector. Next. Now, we consider, uh, uh, consider the periodic uh, circularly polarized GOF, gravitational wave. The simple form of a periodic GOF signal with circular polarization is given by equation two, uh, equation 12. Sorry. And the transition probabilities in this case are given by the equation 13. The above result show that the, all the findings for the linearly polarized GOF previously also hold in case of circularly polarized GOF. Therefore, we can say that, sorry, therefore, we can say that the circularly, uh, where is my slide? You have around four minutes. Just okay, 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 okay. Therefore, uh, we can say that the circularly polarized GOF signals are also good candidate to probe the presence of the gap in resonant detectors. Next slide, please. In this calculation, we also take a uh, aperiodic linearly polarized GOF and uh, like equation for, uh, given by the equation 14 where the Gaussian form of the function gt is given by equation 15 and these all the forms give the transition probabilities in equation 16. Next please. Uh, before we end our discussion we consider a more realistic geo wave forms with the modulated Gaussian wave function gt given by the equation 17 and it also gives the transition probabilities like uh, in the in the equation 18. I summarize all the result due to lack of time. Uh, next. Now, this result uh, in the previous uh, slide is consistent with all the observations made for the periodic GOA with linear polarization. The whole exercise reveals that there can be a transition between the states of the GOA harmonic system induced by the gravitational wave in presence of GUP correction in the Hamiltonian of the system. Such transition do not take place in the ordinary Heisenberg uncertainty framework. Therefore, all these results indicate a new window to probe the presence of quantum gravity effect. Now, we, uh, now I summarize all the results. First, the resonant frequencies capital omega 1 and capital omega 2 of the resonant detectors detector get modified by the gap parameter beta in the presence of GUP, there are more than two transitions, uh, 0 to 2 and 0 to 4 state with different intensities. Thirdly, the, there are both the linear and quadratic terms in GUP parameter beta arises in the transition probabilities. For both the linear and circularly polarized GOA are the good candidate to probe the presence of the generalized uncertainty principle in the resonant detectors. This is valid for both the periodic and aperiodic signal also. At last, we found uh, an upper bound of the dimensionless gap parameter beta zero, which is uh, beta zero less than 10 to the power 28. This is much stronger bound than the beta zero less than 10 to the power 23, which was found earlier. Next, here is my some references, and thank you very much. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Thanks, talk. So it's time for questions. So it's, it's uh, people are questions in the audience, first in the audience, and people from online. If you have questions to ask at this point, can I ask something? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you are when you are talking about transitions, you are talking about transitions between the energy eigenstates of your harmonic oscillator. Is right, that right? Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah, in the presence of the uh, gravitational wave. Right. 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 So whatever form of HIJ you take, linearly polarized or circularly polarized or burst. Okay. okay. So what happens to the, uh, say, the minimum uncertainty states in the presence of the gravitational wave? Suppose there are these coherent states, right? What happens to them? Uh... <clears throat> We'll, uh, we can uh, this is an interesting question we can check for the future discussion 
when your generalized uncertainty principle suppose there are states which obey the generalized uncertainty principle okay. with the equality i'm saying because the coherent states are essentially minimum uncertainty states right right so instead of that if it's minimum general generalized uncertainty then what happens that's the question anyway thank you yeah okay thank you thank you very much so if there are no more questions let's it's time for a quick break short quick break so we shall meet at uh, 10 minutes past 12 uh, for the for the next talk already time already so it's 6 minutes past so no uh, the tea break is for, uh, at 12:10 so we shall meet at 12:25 i'm sorry so we shall meet at 12:25 the next speaker is uh, dr vivash ranjan maji so it's a break of 15 minutes now so we we'll meet at 12:25 So we shall. We are taking a break now. We shall keep break. So we shall meet at twelve twenty-five. So it's a break from twelve ten to twelve twenty-five, fifteen minutes. But we are going a little bit ahead of time. So we shall meet at twelve twenty-five. And the next speaker is uh, Dr. Bhivash Ranjan Maji. So let's meet at twelve twenty-five. Okay. Sorry, I have to quit because I have a class in the oh. afternoon at one o'clock. So okay. I'll try to join later on. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. उटेर I can see your screen. Uh, you, you have to display your PPT. Yes. Uh, can you make it full screen? Yes. Sir. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So I am stopping now. The presentation will come back again. Okay. Sir.
So the next speaker is Dr. Vibhash Ramne Mahaji, and he shall be talking on semi classical attempt to understand battery of dynamics. And this is an invited talk of 40 minutes. So we can we can start start now. Vibhash, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Slide is visible. Yes, slides. Your slide is visible. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, so first of all, I like to give thank to the organizers to invite me to present my work. Uh, today I will be talking about black hole thermodynamics from the semi-classical perspective. The first half of my talk will be the how Bekenstein and Hawking introduced the concept of thermodynamics to black hole. <clears throat> then the last half I will discuss whether we can understand this thermodynamics from the microscopic point of view. Or if we want to understand microscopic point of view, how to, what are the difficulties and what are the attempts we can do at the semi-classical level. So first, let me introduce what is black hole. Uh, suppose I, I have a massive object in my space-time, then we know that the space-time interval can be written in some particular coordinates in this form. There is some factor here, which is not important for the moment. Now, if one asks what are the path of the light rays, then we know that we have to set this equals to zero and that will give you the path of the light rays, which are these 45 degree uh, light cones. And if one particular observer is here, uh, then the relativity will tell that that observer can enter into that region, but nothing can come out from this region to our universe. So this is the region we call, this is a black hole. This white hole region is opposite to that. Everything, everything can come out towards us. Now, in reality, we have a massive object and it is so compact that even light is attracted towards it, light cannot escape from it. So this is what is called the black hole. Now, if this is so, then there is a problem we will face in terms of the second law of thermodynamics. We will see that if a body which has some entropy enters into the black hole, then from our universe, we will see that the entropy of our universe is decreasing. But that is not compatible with the second law of thermodynamics. We know that always entropy should increase in any physical process. So there is a problem then Bekenstein argued that he actually conjectured that black holes should have some entropy. His conjecture was the common entropy in the black hole exterior plus the black hole of our universe. Uh, sorry, black hole exterior means our, our universe plus the black hole of the entropy never decreases. So there must be some entropy of the black hole. So how to assign the entropy of the black hole? So he started with a very basic mathematical construction in his paper. Let us take a Carnewman black hole. Carnewman black hole is a black hole which has a charge as well as rotation. Start with a scaled area. Area is like a area of a sphere. You can think of here it has a rotation. Therefore, this is 4 pi r square. Instead of 4 pi r square, we have a square here. And now if you take the small change of all these parameters of the black hole, by some infinite decimal amount, and you solve for this dm, then you can write down this whole equation in this mathematical form. This mathematical structure is very nice similarity with the usual law of thermodynamics, where you can uh, call this as kind of change in energy. This is kind of t into ds, and this is kind of work term. So this mathematical structure tells you that you can probably assign or some, some, some parameters, you can call them as temperature, entropy, this kind of thing. But this is completely a mathematical analogy. When one wants to tell them these are real temperature or entropy, then they should be consistent with the properties of the thermodynamics, like the temperature should be consistent with the zero law and the entropy, so it should increase in a physical process. 
this as far as this energy is concerned this is fine because the energy of the black hole this concept was already there you know what is the gravitational energy so this is fine but the concept of temperature and entropy little bit is tricky because one should show that this would be consistent with the thermodynamical laws now the next another thing you have to look at since there is a temperature times the change of like d alpha which is like entropy kind of thing then from this thing you can cannot actually fix the proportionality constant or what is the numerical factor should come along with this temperature or entropy because if you multiply this theta by some factor you can divide this alpha by that and so this theta into d alpha will remain same so therefore next question one should address what will be the proportionality factor as well then bekenstein argued that since we know that the hawking area theorem that area increases in physical process then probably this assigning this as a entropy is a correct thing so because it is consistent with the the uh, increase area increase theorem now if you say that okay fine my uh, area can be a candidate for the entropy then the next question as i asked earlier what will be the proportionality constant for that what he did is he first make this as dimensional um, this s beach has to be dimensional so we introduce h bar by hand and therefore this number eta is a dimensional list factor which we need to understand what is this one now this appearance of h h bar factor by hand is nothing new because we know in your statistical mechanics when you calculate entropy from the microstructure then this h bar always appears there through the volume of the space phase so therefore this h bar can be there but this eta is a very tricky thing according to bekenstein it would be somewhat pretentious to attempt to calculate the precise value of eta without knowing the full understanding of quantum reality of black hole so without knowing the quantum theory of gravity we cannot fix this eta but still he argued that probably by some sorry, argument sorry vibhash, sorry, vibhash uh, just one point here you see the h bar you said it's kind of uh, only for dimensions now that's not quite true right i mean um, you see, you could have the entropy in Boltzmann uh, units. I mean, if uh, the Boltzmann constant is dimensionless, is basically a dimensionless quantity, right? It, so it should be like a dimensionless number times area divided by another area. Right. And of course, you know, there is some argument given in Bekenstein's paper as how yes. to choose this reference area. And he chose the Planck area. It's a very good argument right. because... Of, so it's not a trivial thing that the age bar comes in because... Bekenstein goes on to argue that the origin of black hole entropy must be quantum yes. in nature. Yes, yes, right. There... That's true. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say. So that's why I said here that this, this microstructure can, uh, if it is there, then H bar should appear here. Okay, so uh, let us now proceed. So to fix eta, what it did is, I will not give you the calculation, but I will ex uh, explain what is what it did. He considered a one bit of information, which if you throw towards the black hole, then he calculate how much area of the black hole has increased by this uh, engulf of one bit of information. And also we know that the one bit of information carries entropy. So because it has two states, so therefore the number of microstates is omega equals to two. So you know how much entropy should be there. Now, if you use all these information, and saying that my entropy of the black hole is proportional to the area, then using this everything, uh, you can say that the proportionality can be half log two. This two comes because it is the one bit of information, it can have two states. So that's how he actually fixed this, uh, this eta factor. But once you have this entropy, and if you come back to this mathematical structure, by the definition of thermodynamic temperature, you probably can call this as a temperature. But back with Wittgenstein at that moment was very skeptical to interpret this T as a black hole temperature because then black hole should be a thermal object and then it should radiate. But we already know that it cannot, cannot classically escape anything. So therefore, 
so one way he is saying that there is a entropy but other hand he is very skeptical about assigning a temperature that leads to a very problematic situation to the physics community and then the person actually uh, came into this problem is stephen hawking he said that yes black hole can radiate but its radiation is purely quantum mechanical radiation classically it is not possible so this is the first semi classical approach which uh, hawking took and the uh, it is semi classical in the sense that in the space time the space time is not quantized but whatever the external quantum fields are there they are quantized so in that sense it's a semi classical approach we are not quantizing the background we are quantizing the external matter there so what it did is he took a collapsing cell um, space time and then at the past infinity it is you have your you solve your uh, scalar field and you find the modes so at past null infinity you have the modes and those modes are approaching towards the collapsing cell when these are approaching they will suffer blue shift its frequency will be blue shifted when those incoming modes passes through the collapsing cell and come out from the collapsing cell then they will suffer red shift but since the collapsing cell is collapsing so it will there will be no, no compensation between the blue shift and red shift and there will be some net red shift will be there suffered by the scalar modes and when the collapsing cell forms the black hole the red shift is maximal which is exponentially growing and now if one compares these outgoing modes scalar modes with the ingoing modes the outgoing scalar modes will see the ingoing or incoming scalar modes as thermal so this is the main thing he showed the mathematical idea is like this suppose i have a scalar field and we know how to write down the scalar field in terms of creation and annihilation operator and in modes we know that the positive frequency mode is always associated with the annihilation operator and there is a complex conjugate and in this case we have a two types of modes one is incoming which is at past infinity another is outgoing which is at future infinity and therefore the scalar fields can be written in terms of both these two modes this a corresponding to the incoming modes and b corresponding to the outgoing modes now you know that if there are two sets of bases one basis can be written in terms of linear as a linear combination of the other bases so you write down your incoming basis in terms of the outgoing basis so there is some uh, factors are here we know what are these things these are called the probability the mod square of these quantities will give you the probability of finding that particular mode and this there is a star so this out positive star will actually give you the negative frequency mode in terms of the time so therefore if you substitute this i n plus in this first line then you can see that in terms of the outgoing mode the ak can have both positive frequency outgoing mode and negative frequency outgoing mode when you have beta not equals to 0 so you have a mixture of outgoing positive frequency and negative frequency mode sitting with this annihilation operator now if one calculates the number operators corresponding to the outgoing mode in the vacuum of the ingoing mode then there will be this factor and if beta is non zero then you can see that the number of particles in the in mode is non zero so one can see the particle in this particular state with respect to the outgoing observer so this is the kind of uh, skip, uh, kind of calculation is there and you must have a mixture of positive frequency and negative frequency modes to get beta not equals to 0 so since we have here the exponential red shift of the outgoing modes so therefore there is always a positive and negative frequency uh, mixture with respect to the other modes so that's why we have here the particle production and he calculated the particle production for this collapsing cell since we have the schwarzel metric outside the collapsing cell the particle number comes out to be in this form which is both kind of both distribution 
Now, if you compare with the actual Bose distribution, one can calculate the temperature of these modes with respect to the other modes. And if we say that these modes are in thermal equilibrium with the horizon, then one can say that this is also the temperature of the horizon. So this is how Bacon's, uh, sorry, uh, Hawking actually associated temperature with the horizon. Now, once you know the temperature of the horizon, then go back to that mathematical construction, you can find out what should be the entropy. Before going to that, let me show that if there is this eternal black hole, which is not evolving with time, then the static observers see thermal spectrum in the freely falling observers vacuum with the temperature which is proportional to the surface gravity of the black hole. And then therefore the next question one should ask is this temperature is consistent with the zero law of thermodynamics. One can show that indeed it is possible the kappa which is the surface gravity is constant on the horizon and it is not also changing along the generator of the horizon. So therefore any events on the horizon all events are at the same temperature. So all the uh, throughout the horizon, you can have the same temperature. So therefore, it is consistent with the zero law of thermodynamics. Particularly for the car black hole, one can find out the temperature is like this. Now, if you go back that mathematical construction and identify the Hawking temperature as the temperature of the black hole, then immediately you can infer that the entropy of the black hole should be proportional to area. But now the proportionality is constant, proportionality constant is not now, now half log two, rather pi. So this is the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. Now this is what the story of how this entropy, everything has uh, came in the context of black hole. Now once you have assigned the temperature and entropy to the black hole, the next question one should ask whether there is a microscopic description of all these quantities. This is a very difficult question. People have asked this thing in several ways, but till now there is no complete answer. Here I will give some idea whether these approaches can illuminate this thing. I don't have a complete answer, but I can illuminate this thing whether you can approach in this way. This is completely a semi-classical argument and it's for the entropy, it stems from Wall's formalism, who said that since gravity is a diffeomorphism invariant theory, you can find out a no either charge corresponding to that, and you have a no either current, and the no either current corresponding to this diffeomorphism symmetry can be written as a uh, covariant derivative of an anti symmetric quantity. Now, if you perturb this no either current on the Cauchy surface, uh, around a stationary solution of black hole, stationary black hole solution. And if you have, then you have two boundaries, one is the horizon and another is the infinity. Then using the Gauss theorem, you can write down this perturbation in these two forms. And one term which is calculated the horizon can be shown to be proportional, uh, can be shown to the temperature times the change of entropy. And the other term, is like your this delta m plus pdv term. So now one can show that the calculation of this potential JV, anti-symmetric potential JV on the horizon is related to entropy if you multiply by the inverse of temperature. So that is the argument of the uh, world that you can write down a geometrical construction of the entropy for the horizon by this formula, where this JV corresponding to the no either current for your diffeomorphism, which is a killing symmetry. And therefore, since it is related to the entropy of the black hole, probably this symmetry has a big role to understand the microscopic description of the horizon entropy. So now you can go a little bit deeper uh, towards this calculation. This stems from a completely different theory. Let us now digress from the black hole thermodynamics to some quantum field theory, which is 2D conformal quantum field theory, where it has been shown that if you have a 2D conformal theory, the charge corresponding to this local conformal symmetry after quantization satisfies this relation. This is called Virazoro algebra, where this QM are the uh, Fourier modes of your 
charge corresponding this conformal symmetry. And C is your uh, is known as the uh, known as the central charge. Now, for this particular system, if one calculate the microstructure and calculate the entropy for that system, the entropy comes out to be in this form. This is known as Cardi formula. So it shows that probably it shows that actually this microstructure information is there in the central charge and the zeroth mode, mode of the charge. So now you ask the question in a reverse way. If we somehow can describe a similar kind of algebra for the black hole, and if you take this is the entropy formula, substitute all these values of C and Q0 here, see whether it is A by 4H bar or not. Then you can say that probably this Q0 and C are encoding all the information of the microstructure of the black hole thermodynamics. So this is the idea people took by, by Brown and Hanno first. They consider a asymptotically ADS, uh, ADS space time and they found out the deformorphism symmetries which keeps the asymptotic ADS structure preserved. Corresponding to those charges, they calculate some kind of bracket. I will show how to define this bracket later in the next slide. But what they saw that the Fourier modes of those charges corresponding to this bracket, they satisfy similar kind of Virazor algebra. It is not exactly the quantum calculation. It is purely a classical calculation, but still a classical construction of the bracket can show this type of structure where you can identify what should be the C and Q naught. And if you use the Cardi formula, it comes out to be exactly the bekenstein hawking entropy. So therefore, what I say that in reverse way, you can probably argue that if you understand Q naught and C properly at the quantum mechanical level, probably you can understand the uh, microscopic structure of the black hole thermodynamics. But remember that this calculation was done away from the horizon. So now next thing is whether we can do the same calculation near the horizon. So for that, what we did is we consider some very basic uh, information of the uh, gravity where Padnavan showed that the bulk part of the action is related to the surface part of the action. So there is a relation between bulk part of the action and the surface part of the action. The idea is if you have a uh, action which is Einstein Hilbert action. The Einstein Hilbert action can be divided into gamma square term, which is known as bulk term, and another is the surface term, which is derivative of the gamma and related by some relation, which is in the language of Padmanabhan is called holographic relation. And since the entropy is proportionality, proportional to the area, which is completely different from what we know for the usual system where the entropy depends on volume. So probably then the entropy or the information of the black hole is lying on the horizon. So with this idea, and also there are some instances like bulk part and surface part are related. So therefore the information of the bulk part is there in the surface part. And also if you calculate the surface part of the action, that gives you the entropy of the horizon. And also one can show that if you start with only the surface part of the action, you can extract the equation of motion for the gravity from the surface part only. So all this information tells you that probably all the informations are uh, lying on the area or the surface of the black hole. So with this idea, what we did is we considered the surface part of the action. We took a particular surface part, which is the given shocking your surface part. And then we write down the surface part in the bulk by using the Gauss theorem. So in the volume we have written, so there is a covariant derivative of this whole quantity over the volume. And next you calculate the no either current corresponding to that, that comes out to be this one. So remember that although this is a surface part, but since no either current uh, can be uh, defined on a particular surface and it can be non-vanishing on a surface, so therefore, even if you are starting with the surface term, you have a particular non-trivial no either current here. And with this no either current, we define a particular kind of bracket, 
which is the Lie variation along another j of this charge, an anti-symmetric combination of that. So this is the way we have defined a bracket, which also uh, motivated from the original uh, brown henotype uh, charge also. And then the next thing is one have to identify what are these deformorphism vectors. So what we did is we construct our space time in a particular coordinate system. And the coordinate system is such that the observer can see the horizon. And then we ask the question that suppose we find out those deformorphism which preserve the horizon near to the horizon. So that means this Lie derivative of GV is not zero everywhere in the space time, rather it is asymptotically zero on the horizon. So you are finding those deformorphism which keeps the near horizon structure in a particular coordinate system in which horizon is properly defined. It is not like that a freely falling observer's coordinates where horizon is transparent, you can define the whole space time by a single coordinate system. So it is kind of like a static observer which can see, who can see the uh, horizon properly. So you now solve this equation and find out this j and substitute all these j here and calculate this bracket for that uh, charge corresponding to the brown here surface term. We found that the central charge comes out to be in this form and the zero mode of the charge comes out to be this form. And if you substitute everything back to this Cardiff party formula, it gives you exactly A by 4G, which your Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So you get the Bekenstein entropy through this calculation. Then you again argue that since these are coming from this, so therefore probably all the microscopic structure are hiding inside this Q0 and C. Uh, so sorry, sorry, Bibhash, your yes. formula has no h bar in it. Uh, it's yes. a completely classical result, right? Uh, so this uh, is not yeah. the Beckenstein of This is not the Beckenstein okay. of uh, So this h bar is not there because because I took h bar one here, but you can take this uh, in that unit g bar g is actually h bar. No, it's not a matter of units. You see, you look at the algebra. The algebra is a classical algebra. Right. Where is H in there? You have no H bar anywhere in your calculation, if I understand correctly. Is that is that true or not? Ah, okay, I understand what you are asking. So, uh, so if you look at this Cardi formula as well, this well, Cardi formula, formula is different. You're not using the Cardi formula. Cardi formula uses the Grassor algebra where there is an H bar. It's a quantum. Right. That is a quantum right. commutator. But your right. your bracket is defined through the Lie algebra, through the through the Lie right. derivative. It's a right. classical algebra, right? Right. You right. of course have classical algebras which look very similar. I mean, for right. instance, if you have a rotational killing vector, then you get the rotational algebra, the rotational algebra. Right. Right. But their h bar is not there in that algebra. That's what I want to point yes. out. So when you finally okay. get to the so final, I answer, understand what is your there is problem. no h bar. So let me yes. show you this structure. So if you look at this uh, this thing. Usually h bar is lying here. So in this formula, you can multiply h by h bar. So that's and classical action. Yeah. The classical yes. action does not have an h bar. Why should it have, yeah, have an h bar? Here h bar does not appear uh, automatically. But the idea is like that h bar you can actually handle by this I mean, way. The analysis you are doing is purely classical. That's what I want to mention. Right, right. So that's why I'm saying this h bar does not arise naturally. Okay, so is it is it true that you have the classical algebra, you compute the classical algebra, and you get a central charge from there, and yes, and you are putting it in the Cardi formula, and you are getting a formula like a, uh, the area law. But is it yes. is it you are, are you doing something like this that you are elevating the classical algebra to the quantum level, and then you no, are what I am saying is that what I what I did is completely classical calculation. And within this classical calculation, what we show that if this formula is also valid for this type of thing for, um, yeah, but, for but your then apple, you problem that you, you have the h bar missing there. So that that's what problem. I'm saying. This h bar you can actually handle by divide this h bar q naught here h bar q uh, so put h bar here and on the upper put the h bar. the classical algebra to the quantum commutators. It's See, a, uh, in quantum, this, this Virajolo algebra is a completely quantum calculation. 
here i am doing a classical calculation that's what i am saying that it's a big surprise why it is happening but thing is that it gives something like entropy okay. i don't know if you can call it is a hawking entropy or bekenstein hawking entropy or anything but it has a value which is a by 4g okay so okay. then the okay. idea is probably it's completely a possibility that looking at this q naught and c you can find out the microstructure and then everything can comes out properly Okay. So therefore, I don't have a complete answer corresponding to this, what you are asking, but it gives you an idea. Probably you can quantize this Q naught and did some quantization corresponding to these values. Probably that can give you the hints of the microstructure. Okay, so what we have is that if you do this calculation classically, you can have a quantity which is like your Bekenstein Hawking entropy, then our argument is probably this all these quantities Q0 and C can have some information of the microstructure of the horizon. So if this is so, then there is a difference between the conventional physics and black hole horizon thermodynamics. In conventional physics, we have a degrees of freedom which are absolute in the sense that you don't have a coordinate dependent notion of degrees of freedom. And the entropy, which is related to the logarithm of the degrees of freedom, they are absolute and there is no observer dependency in these things. But in black hole case, we just saw that if this is the black hole horizon entropy, then what we have is that there is some particular observer, we can see this entropy. And those particular observer will say that this particular diffeomorphism vectors are related to the entropy. And this particular Q naught is the related to the entropy. You are actually uh, take a subset of all the allowed diffeomorphisms for our theory by this particular observer, which can assign this entropy kind of thing by this particular calculation. Therefore, if the degrees of freedom are associated or can be extracted from this Q naught, they should have some observer dependence notion. So in this case, diffeomorphism degrees of freedom of the horizon entropy can be observer dependent. Now this is all about the uh, entropy. Now next question one should ask how the horizon has temperature. What is the basic mechanism by which horizon is getting some temperature? The question you can ask in this way. If you take a cylinder of gas, we know that the temperature of the cylinder of gas is due to the uh, due to the uh, kinetic theory of gas molecules. So we know the mechanism. Why? Uh, what is the source of energy for the temperature of the gas molecules or a cylinder of gas? Now, similar question you can ask: What is the mechanism for uh, the horizon to have the temperature? So we build a model to look at this particular problem. What we did is we particular assign a coordinate to this Schwarzschild matrix. We have written in the eddington Frankenstein null coordinates. And we consider a massless charge this particle moving very near to the horizon in this particular coordinate. Since it's massless, it will uh, travel along the null path. So we also define a particular null path, which is normal to this U constant, U is the outgoing null crystal coordinate. You can find out the tangent vector corresponding to the null path for this particular metric, which are like this. Remember, this T is not Schwarzschild time. It's a eddington Frankenstein time. So now if you travel, the, if your particle is travel through this path, and if you confine your path very near to the horizon, then you can find out the energy corresponding or Hamiltonian corresponding to that particular particle. The outgoing Hamiltonian or energy comes out to be in this form very near to the horizon. I kept up to the first order of the expansion around the horizon. This RH is the location of the horizon. And the ingoing path is proportional to the negative of the radial momentum of the particle. Now, if you look at this particular outgoing path, it has a structure which is like position into momentum kind of thing, XP kind of structure. 
an XP kind of Hamiltonian which arise in various places in our physics and uh, uh, it is basically uh, in quantum mechanics people looked at it very deeply what the nature it has is it's an unstable Hamiltonian in the sense that if you write down the equations of motion which comes out to be this and you see that this momentum near the horizon diverges because here Eddington Finkelstein time tends to minus infinity is your horizon, so the momentum is diverging. So it gives you a very unstable nature locally near to the horizon. You can understand this unstable of this Hamiltonian from the, this point of view, you can write down in a new canonical variable where this Hamiltonian looks like an inverted harmonic oscillator. So we have a model where you have a particle which is confined very near to the horizon, and this particle is massless. And this, for this particular path, null path, the Hamiltonian, outgoing Hamiltonian is this particular form, which is unstable in nature. Then this next question we asked whether this unstability can have some quantum signature, or we can understand this unstability at the quantum mechanical level, quantum mechanical level at, by some other physical quantity. So if you ask this question, then first thing what we did is that Suppose you have this Hamiltonian and you ask whether a particle can tunnel through this Hamiltonian or not. So for that thing, we took this Hamilton-Jacobi formalism and we calculate the outgoing action and ingoing action. These are standard thing. For outgoing path, what we have is the outgoing wave function or outgoing mode has this structure. Since that it has a singularity around x equals to zero, at x equals to zero and if you consider the mode is crossing just the horizon just behind to the outside then it will pick a imaginary part and that imaginary part will give you a real part in the wave function and then, then the, you will have a finite probability of the outgoing particle to escape from the horizon i will come to the much more rigorous calculation for this hamiltonian for this particular hamiltonian in a different way but it is just a starting point, although it is not rigorous, but it gives you some hints. Then what happens is for the ingoing, you will see that the probability is almost very near to one. So therefore the tunneling probability, which is the ratio of these two outgoing probability, and ingoing probability, it comes out to be the Boltzmann factor and you can compare with the Boltzmann factor, you can find out the temperature. So it says that this X equals to zero where the momentum is divergent, the instability point gives you some tunneling probability which can tell you that there is a temperature associated to the horizon. Now with this thing, this local instability provides a non-zero quantum probability for escaping the outgoing particle through the horizon and then the particle can feel a horizon as a thermal object. Now let us go to much more rigorous calculation of that, which is like your Hawking calculation, not exactly similar, but I did a similar calculation, which, which I will not show here, but the simple calculation I will show, which is almost very near to the Hawking calculation, where you have ingoing mode and outgoing mode, and there is a boggle of coefficients. So but what we did is that... You have three minutes more. Yeah, I'll complete no problem. So you consider this particular Hamiltonian and you take a particular uh, wave function which is defined at t equals to zero. Then you consider the time evolution of this particular wave function by this Hamiltonian. Now suppose you have an initial wave function which is plane wave and the later time wave function will be this. Now you ask the question whether this later time wave function can be written as a mixture of negative frequency and positive frequency with respect to some monochromatic modes, which is like e to the power minus i omega t. If your beta not equals to zero, then it is a mixture of this thing, later time wave function. We wrote this thing is a much more uh, suitable form, which is like a Fourier transformation of this, where you can identify this alpha as this one, this Fourier uh, coefficient, and beta is minus of omega of this Fourier coefficient, which is I call this a mixing coefficient, and if mod beta square is non-zero, then you can say that this later time wave function is mixture of positive and negative with respect to some particular, this particular, this type of particular monochromatic wave. So you calculate this thing, 
and one finds that the mod of Fisher square is comes out to be in this form, which is like your Fermi distribution. Now you may wonder why this is Fermi distribution. Uh, this is because of the structure of the Hamiltonian. This is XP. So in quantum mechanics, you can write down XP plus PX. So there is a first order derivative with respect to position. So it is like Dirac nature. So therefore this plus one is coming there. So here also you can find out the temperature is coming out like to be h bar kappa by two pi. So all this you tells you that this particular Hamiltonian, which is defined locally very near to the horizon, probably can illuminate the mechanism for which the horizon has a temperature. So therefore we conjecture that the horizon creates a local level stability, which acts as the source of the quantum temperature of the black hole. So this we tested for various cases like in car black hole, we have tested also for a generic null surface. We also tested this one and it works fine. This approach works fine. So this is the last part, I, part of my this, uh, uh, lecture. So this is the, what we have now is that this Bekenstein Hawking entropy is a very special one. It, it actually depends on the horizon area contrary to the usual thermodynamical system. And therefore, all the information as if lying on the horizon and concept of thermodynamics is the observer dependent in this case. And what we know so far by this discussion is that the deformorphism uh, degrees of freedom should be observer dependent. And the charges for the asymptotic structure preserving, uh, preserving the deformorphism may illuminate about this deformorphism degrees of freedom. And the temperature of the horizon can be a result of this local instability. Far, we are, are we far from the microscopic description? Of course, we are very far from, we don't know anything about it. This no ether charge may provide information about the degrees of freedom. In one of my paper, I showed that this Q0 corresponding to the no ether charge can be associated, can be related to the Hamiltonian of the black hole system. So therefore, if you quantize, if you know how to quantize Q0, Q0 probably you can say about this microstructure of the black hole. And Later part, I show that this instability can provide a mechanism, whether this can actually gives you a mechanism which tells you that this particular instability gives your system a thermal equilibrium at later time where you can have a equilibrium thermal system. And then this particular mechanism for which the horizon makes the equilibrium system thermal object, probably we can uh, say about that. Thank you. Okay, so let's end the speaker. So it's time for questions now. Yeah, members and people in the online mode. So are there questions? Um Bibas, let me let me ask something. So what is the yes, interface? Please. The, do you have a physical interpretation of this Q0? What this Q0 is measuring? Okay, uh, right now I don't have any much more idea about this Q0. I'm trying to understand, but what I have been able to show that uh, you can uh, as so you can relate this Q0 with the surface term of the gravitational um, action, like the uh, derivative of the gamma term of the action, you can relate with this Q0. So that's why I'm saying it's a Hamiltonian of the black hole system, probably you can call this Q0. So this much information I have, but I am trying to understand whether I can say something more about this Q0, but I don't have any particular answer for this. Okay, so are there any more questions? So Dibhash, I have a kind of naive question. Can you hear me? Yes, please, sir. Go ahead. Uh, I was wondering, see, you have an infinite dimensional algebra, right? The Lie right. algebra. So yes. often, when you take a Lie algebra, classical Lie algebra, and promote it to a quantum theory, you tend to get anomalies. So do you know whether right. you will find anomalies in this symmetry? First of all, in the context of 2D conformal theory, you know that this is the anomalous term. Right. But so since in the gravity case, the we are not quantizing quantity. anything. So probably <laughs> I don't have any answer. What is the anomalous term here? Yeah, I was just wondering if your Lie algebra becomes anomalous when you quantize it. 
so that is the question how to quantize we don't know okay okay so there is one so, more question. Uh, sorry a uh, follow up on the quest uh, on the on your question Nongtabo, is yeah. uh, if you go back to the to the uh, lee bracket algebra which you wrote down can you please uh, flash that for a second um yeah. yes one? yeah but that's just the definition of q1 q2 so i'm just wondering is how do you know from this that there has to be a central charge see this actually relates to the question that was just asked do you yes. know that this so, algebra a central charge okay so again i will say that this is defined by hand just to make this bracket anti-symmetric and one and two and once you calculate this one it somehow gives this structure so there is no, no but, uh, but usually uh, a central charge you see a central charge changes the algebraic structure right usually yes. an algebra would not have a, like take the rotation algebra that you use in quantum mechanics there is no central charge only you have this right? part right so here in this case when you take the algebra be it a lee bracket algebra it doesn't matter it's still an algebra mm -hmm. How do you know? How do you would even guess that there is a central charge? That's what I'm okay, asking. So what is the we don't have any particular guess. We just proceed towards the calculation blindly. So and you're saying that, that if you calculate it, you get a central charge. Is that what you're saying? I will not call it as a central charge. It's kind of this type of form is there. That's what so I in mean. other words, there's something left over apart from the charges, right? Is that is that the statement? Right. I course. mean, what you have not yes, actually yes. defined the central charge. So if you went back and defined the central charge, what you call the central charge, in terms of the basic dynamical variables, I think things would be clearer. Right. Okay. right. I think this right. is what happens in a classical when you calculate the classically in a, in a classical theory, the structure that is, uh, is exactly similar to the right hand side of the uh, Q, Q and Q uh, that most of yeah. yeah, it's completely analogy. I calculated from the definition and you have reached this point. The right right. Side. right. So there is one more question. Sir, sir uh, I don't know whether my question makes enough sense, but uh, what I am trying to ask is that uh, you have done a totally classical calculation and showed that the area, the entropy is following the Bekenstein Hawking formula. But uh, what I am uh, trying to understand is, in that case, it also should state that there is some kind of app that could have the classical temperature in your calculator. It should have something analogous to the Hawking radius. But I don't understand. I do not understand. Okay, so this, as far as temperature is concerned, there is no classical concept because you see this temperature is proportional to the H bar. So if you put this H bar tends to zero, it uh, vanishes. Okay, so what you have is that in the first law, you have T into dS, uh, rather combination of the second law. So this T dS, you, when you write down in Bekenstein way, that is also a classical. Like if you look at this mathematical structure, uh, this one, this, 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 this one. This is also a, there is no H bar. So what we do is always we put a H bar by hand here and put a H bar by hand so that the matches with proper dimension and everything is there. So in classical cal calculation, this H bar does not appear. Of course, it should not appear in classical calculation. So with the idea that if it is something related to area, then we buy, buy some, uh, by hand, we always put this H bar there. So this is how the classical calculation goes. But of course, if you do the actual quantum calculation, if we know that one, then probably this H bar will come automatically. So that is what is there. <laughs> okay, so thank you Vivash for a very nice talk. So let's thank the speaker once again. Okay, thank you. Uh, so now we have here and we should be Dr. Lance at 2.15. 2.15 Indian standard time. Indian standard time. 2.15. So the final for the